right, so today we are on lesson three in removing the curse and receiving the blessing. blessing. Lesson number three in removing the curse and receiving the blessing. This one is so full of teaching that it's a possibility I may have to break this into two. I don't know. I will see how the Lord leaves. But I'm feeling that in my spirit. And if he wants me to do it, he will make it very clear to me. So today we're looking at the curse of anger. Look at your neighbor and said the curse of anger. Yes, that thing is a curse. It is part of the curse. Listen, as I've taught you in Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 through 45, when we first get born again, Jesus Christ by his Holy Spirit completely cleanses everything. Come on, think with me of when you first got saved, how fresh everything was. Everything was fresh. All the things that were problems in your life, they were distant memories. Amen. And I believe at that time he did a complete cleansing. Some of us do not get under good teaching and proper discipleship to keep those doors closed. And in time, we get careless and we allow the doors to be open. And what happens? The Bible tells us that when that unclean spirit was driven out and he walks in the dry places and he finds no rest, he says, I will return to the house from which I was driven out. And he comes back and he finds it cleansed, swept, decorated but empty because we have not allowed the renewing of our minds to fully take deposit in every area of our soul. You see, your spirit is intact, but your soul is where the debris from your past life is. If you don't believe me, get the teaching on body, soul, and spirit. It's back there. It will enlighten you. So your spirit is intact. But that stuff of your past, when we leave the door open, the enemy comes back and he stirs up what was in your soul and you did not allow the door to remain closed. Come on. Are you tracking with me here? Are you catching this? Hello? Anger is one of those things. Anger is one of those things. Listen to me. It's a sad situation. But there are pastors in the pulpits who preach up a storm and they go home and beat their wives. Give them black eyes. Punch holes in the, in the walls. Beat up the children. And these are people that are genuinely saved. Are you with me here? The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, the renovation, the reconstruction of your mind that involves your intellect, your emotion, and your will. We must allow the word to renovate and reconstruct those old patterns and drive them out. And not only that, but we must submit to the discipline of the word of God and it will come in. Close those doors and establish godly patterns. Are you with me here? Is this making sense to you? Let me begin by saying, and I know many people here will relate to this. Anger is something that many people use to manipulate, control, and 
not intimidate other yes. people. Yes. Are you with me here? Yes. It's not of God. It's an ungodly spirit. In Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 9, the Bible says, Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry. For anger, listen to this people, God is saying this in his word, this is a direct quote. For anger resteth in the bosom of fools. Whoo! I didn't say that people, I just repeated what the word says. Anger resteth in the bosom of fools. In Genesis chapter 49, verses 5 through 7, it says, and this is just before Jacob dies, he is blessing all of his sons. And here he says, Simeon and Levi are brethren. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. O oh my soul, come not thou into their secret unto their assembly. Mine honor be not united, for in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a wall. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Now you can go back to the word and get the background for this. But the situation here was the men of Shechem saw Jacob's daughter Dinah. And one of the men loved her and he raped her. And he wanted to marry her. And so he went to Jacob and his sons and asked permission, you know, that was backwards. Right. But nevertheless, he's trying to make it right. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, we will allow you to marry her, but first of all, all the men have to be circumcised. Mm -hmm. And so they went with it. Mm -hmm. And while the men were weak and sick, they went in and killed them all. Yep. Every one of them. And Jacob said, that's not right. And that's what he's talking about here. In their anger, it was a bad thing that was done to their sister. But listen to me, you cannot take it in your own hands and violate the word of God. You have to wait on God to make it right. You can't take it in your own hands. I'm going to show you as we progress here a man who took matters in his own hands, and it cost him his blessing. Wow. A blessing that he'd struggled <coughs> for so many years for. Amen? So, what we find here is that their anger caused them to take matters in their own hands and slew all the men in Shechem. We will find in both Old and New Testaments that anger and wrath are very, very closely related. Let me quickly share with you Webster's definition of the word anger. Listen to this very carefully. It is a violent, revengeful passion or emotion. You catch that? It's a violent, revengeful passion or emotion. One of the root words from where we get the word anger, it literally means to choke. Are you with me? It literally means to choke. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 and 27, it says, in your anger, do not sin, from the NIV. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not, listen to this, do not give the devil a foothold. What is it saying? If I remain angry and go to bed angry, let the sun go down on my wrath, I am opening a door and giving a place to the devil. Are you with me here? The King James says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun.
sun go down on your wrath, neither give place to the devil. A foothold is a place. Have you ever seen people going up the mountains, very steep, and they go like that and they find a place where they can get some footing? Hello? Yeah. And they have to search and search till they find a place where they get footing. That's what we allow the enemy to do, to get a place where he can find footing so he can step. Hello? So a foothold is a place. Don't give the devil a place where he can find footing so he can walk in your life. Somewhere where he can stand and operate. If he doesn't find that place, people, he's got to go somewhere else to look for it. Come on now, are you with me? Yes. What we find Paul saying here is that we allow the devil in our lives when we fail to manage our emotions. Anger is a problem. But the bigger problem is the way we manage it, is the way we respond to it. So Paul says we are giving Satan a foothold, a place to stand and operate when we do not manage our emotions. Remember we said anger is a passion, a violent, revengeful emotion. The quote Dr. Neil Anderson, he says, anger, which turns into bitterness and unforgiveness, is an open invitation to demonic control. Are you with me? Wow. Anger, which turns into bitterness and unforgiveness, is an open invitation to demonic control. Listen. Wow. It's not worth it to walk around in unforgiveness. It is not worth it, people. The enemy will take advantage of that foothold you have given him, and he's going to come in and make your life a living hell right here on earth. Are you with me? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. Paul says, to whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. I'm going to stop there for a moment. The word forgive in the Greek is, is from the same root as the word grace. The word grace in the Greek is charis. And it is something we do not deserve. It is undeserved favor. It is actually getting the opposite of what we really deserve. We deserve judgment and punishment. But God the Father sees that in Jesus Christ when he took all of the punishment and subjected himself to the horrors of the cross. God the Father looks at that and he filters our actions through that and he gives us grace. Are you with me? Amen. So grace is something we do not deserve. It is not a feeling or an emotion. It is a settled fact. It is a settled truth of God. It is an everlasting undeniable, immutable truth of God. The grace that he has given to us. Hear me. Forgive in the Greek is from the same root as the word grace. What am I saying? The person doesn't have to deserve the forgiveness. They don't have to deserve it. You have to give it. And it's not an emotion. You don't forgive because you feel like it. You forgive because it's a separate truth of the word of God. It says forgive and you shall be forgiven. Anything beyond that, we are opening a door for the enemy to find a place to put his foot so 
he can stand there and torment you. Come on, are you with me? So we forgive. We don't have to feel it. The person doesn't have to deserve it. They don't even have to say thank you for forgiving me. No, no, no. You just do it and leave it into God's hands and move on and walk in the blessing. Shut out the curse. Leave it alone. So verse 11 here in 2 Corinthians 2, it says, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Are we ignorant of his devices? Oh, come on. When we don't do what the word says, we're acting as though we're ignorant of his devices, and he comes in and he overreaches. Do you ever see him two boxers in a ring? And one has such a long reach, he can reach all the way over into the other one's corner and just knock him out. <laughs> That's what it means here where it says, lest Satan gets an advantage. All of that is one word in the Greek, and it means to overreach. It also means to commit. In other words, Satan earnestly commits the opportunity to get a stronghold in your life so he can operate. Are you with me? Oh, yes. Lest Satan should get an advantage over us. It also means to defraud. He wants to defraud you. He wants to take you for what you have. Like, like Bernie Madoff took all those people for all those millions or billions of dollars, whatever it was. He defrauded them. That's what the devil wants to do with you. He wants to take away your peace. Listen to me. You are saved. Your name is in the book of life, written with the blood of Jesus Christ. You are saved. But you live a miserable life here. You'll be no testimony. You'll have no impact on your generation. You won't be able to win anybody to Jesus Christ. For who wants the miserable life that you have? Because that is Satan's plan to make your life miserable. You have no joy. You have no peace. You have it, but it's dormant. It's hidden. It's not working. Hello? He doesn't mind you getting saved. Sit in a corner and fold your hands and live miserable and die and go to heaven. That's what he would like. But God, Jesus said, the thief comes only to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. As a testimony that the Zoe, the very life that God has in himself is now present in you. Yes. And we must demonstrate that in the earth. Amen. Glory to God. Are you catching this? Yes. Amen. Amen. Let's look at an example in 1 Peter chapter 5. 5 B through 9. It says, Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And the next verse goes on to say, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, who resists steadfast in the faith. Listen, he goes about, he prowls around as a roaring lion looking for a prey. Are you with me? Amen. He's looking for a prey because not everyone is a prey. Amen. Come on, if you're walking in the word of God and being in obedience to the word and have an up-to-date yeah. relationship with the Lord and living... The abundant life. You are not a prey. So he's got to keep looking. Hello. He's got to keep looking. All right. So he is always on the prowl looking for a foothold. And one of the places he will find that foothold is when 
when we operate in pride. And what you're going to find in your own personal study is that pride and anger are very closely related. They are very closely related. All right? So when we insist on our own way, refusing to submit to anyone, we're operating in a proud spirit. What we're in effect saying is that my way is better than your way. We refuse to humble ourselves before the other person. Have you ever met people all the time, it's my way or the highway? Mm -hmm. Okay. While Satan, listen to me, while Satan is making his rounds and checking us out to see if he can find a foothold, he finds in us pride and he quickly jumps on the opportunity. Are you with me? He quickly takes advantage, the advantage we give him, and he comes to devour the prey. The word devour here, as used in this passage, it has the idea of consuming, consuming, taking control over. If you have a predisposition to be angry, he sees this as a foothold, and he comes to consume or control you with anger. Is this making sense? I see some people getting it. The rest of you need to get the CD and listen to it over and over and over again. Oh, come on, because we're going to break that curse of anger today. Jesus did it more than 2,000 years ago. In Galatians 3.13, it says, Curse is every woman hangeth on the tree that the blessing of Abram may come upon the Gentiles through faith. That's us. Hallelujah. Listen to me. If you grew up in a family where one or both parents were angry constantly, there is a good possibility you are easily angered. Oh, come on. We don't like to talk about generational curses. But this matter of these things passing from generation to generation is mentioned over 300 times in the Word of God. This is not a figment of our imagination. I know you can look in families and you can see recurring patterns in families. So, these things pass on from generation to generation. Listen to me. There are generational spirits that are assigned to your families. And they will be observing your family for hundreds of years, way back in your generation. They know your hot buttons. They know your weaknesses. They know right where to push and get you off track. We have to recognize this, break it, and refuse to open the door. I am telling you, Jesus Christ has done everything for us, but we need to appropriate it. We need to walk it out. We need to practice it by the word of God. I'll tell you a quick story. Yesterday, we were on our way to our granddaughter's um, baby shower. We are going to be great grandparents. Yeah. October 27th. We, if he arrives on time, we're going to be great grandparents. So we were on our way there. And well, actually, we met Joe here and Joe drove us over. And I was driving here and I had this excruciating pain. Just excruciating pain. And this pain has bothered me on and off since I was a little girl. And I have prayed and received healing. And all of a sudden, the symptom came back excruciatingly. I was about to cry. My husband is asking, what's happened? I was about to cry. I was in so much pain. But the Holy Ghost said to me, that's only a symptom. You have been healed from that. Oh, man, you could have heard me miles away. Oh, you don't have to shout for him to hear, but it just made me feel better. And I declared that my healing for whatever this is was accomplished. When those cat and nine tails tore out the back of the Lord Jesus Christ, that even his organs were exposed and said, whatever is the root of this, it was done with back there. Now you get off me. You're a lying 
abundant life. Are you with me? Yes. All right, let's look at Genesis chapter 20, verses 3 through 5. Actually, that should be Exodus. Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 through 5. It says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Listen, idols are not just things that people worship stones, they worship this, they worship that. Once you begin to worship that, it's no longer a stone. There is a satanic spirit that gets behind it. Amen. Amen. When these are worshipped, it is such a disservice and a dishonor to God that God views it as iniquity. And that is what is passed on to the third and fourth generation and can be manifested in many ways in our lives. In areas we, we may not even think of it, but way back there, way, way back there, and these demonic influences that's been assigned to your generation to try and keep you bound, understand these things, and it's a hot button for you. Are you with me here? Is this making sense? So he can use that in many areas of our lives, including anger. Let's look at the word iniquity, where it says he visits the iniquity upon the children to the third and fourth generation. That word iniquity, it could also be translated perversity, fault, mischief, sin. And that which is perverse is that which moves away from the truth. When you pervert something, you take something good and you defile it, okay? So this word iniquity also comes from a root that means to crook, to make crooked. So you take something that's perfectly straight and you make it crooked. That's iniquity. Are you catching this? Amen? Amen? Yes. To pervert, to do wrong. Let me say something here. Come here, Joe. Come here, Anne-Marie, very quickly. Come here, Mr. Clark. Stand right there. This is, this is two-thirds of our family. Two of the children are not here. But do you see the physical resemblances? Yes. Yeah? Yes. So these are genetic inheritances. These Grown folks that are still our children, they have genetic inheritances from us, whether they like them or not. They're there. Thank you, guys. So now, you could see the physical resemblance. You could see the physical genetic inheritance. But the spiritual ones, you cannot see. Well, my point to you is just the way you have generic physical inheritance that you receive from your parents, your grandparents, your great-grandparents. There are also genetic spiritual inheritances that are passed down through the blood. Yes. Are you with me? Amen. Spiritual inheritances, good or bad, we have received and we must face them and deal with them. We can break that cycle mm -hmm. because of Jesus Christ. He's already broken it. Hallelujah. We just have to appropriate it, believe Hallelujah. it, 
and begin to walk as though it's true. Listen to me. You can have a predisposition to anger, but when something comes that will pull that out of you, you can say no. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I will not fall prey to this. I will not do this. I will walk away. Father, in the name of Jesus, this is a big temptation for me right now. Holy Spirit, I need you. I need your help. Help me now in the name of Jesus. Come on. If you need to leave the room, leave the room. You need to go for a drive, go for a drive. But do not let that anger get that foothold to climb up your mountain and come and camp out. Come on. Are you with me here? I want to say something. There is nothing in our walk with the Lord that is passive and lazy. We must appropriate. We must apply. We must walk out. We must consistently confess the scriptures. It's not what you say occasionally. It gets from confession to a proclamation. I am proclaiming what the word says about me. Anne Marie called me on her way to work one day this week, and she's listening to Keith Moore. She got so excited. She said, Mommy, I just listened to Keith Moore. He says, the devil should find us very difficult to get along with. <laughs> Come on, are you with me? Oh, he should find us very difficult to get along with because we're proclaiming the word. We're proclaiming the word. We're believing what the word says about us. And we're resisting the evil one. And the Bible says if we resist the devil, he will flee. We don't even have to do any work. Just resist. Just resist. You don't have to fight yet. Just resist. Stand your ground and resist. Amen. And you see him gone. Hallelujah. That's the word of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So he should find us very difficult to get along with. Very difficult to work with. Yeah. When we get up in the morning, he should be nervous. Amen. Not Amen. us being nervous. He should be nervous. Amen. Oh, I'm not going to get to work my anger thing on Miss Clark today. She's on to me. Ooh. Ooh. And he's really nervous. Come on now. This is real in the spirit, people. Yes. This is real in the spirit. That's why Paul says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers. Amen. Rulers, spiritual, rulers of spiritual wickedness in high places, this is for real. Amen. So, it's a great possibility you could have inherited the predisposition towards anger. We must face it. We must confront it. We must deal with it. Because of the mercy of God demonstrated in Jesus Christ on the cross, we can break the curse and remove the iniquity. Oh, come on. The blood of Jesus Christ is sufficient. The blood of Jesus Christ is efficacious for Every adversity that wants to attach itself to our soul, we don't have to fall prey to it and roll over and play dead. You may have to work at it a lot. This is not salvation by works, not at all. But we must apply. James says, show me your faith. And I will show you my faith by my works. James 2.26 says, As the body without the spirit is dead, so is faith without works or corresponding action. You must have corresponding action to your faith. In Western society, we don't understand that. And that's why it's imperative for us to study the scriptures, learn the Jewish roots of our faith, and understand the Jewish mindset. Because they truly understand that faith is demonstrated by works. You read that in the Old Testament. You see it clearly demonstrated in the Old Testament. I'm waiting on 
the Lord in my faith. I have faith and I'm waiting on the Lord. And in the meantime, the devil is punching you every which way. No, no, no. But when you stand up, square your shoulders, and say, glory to God, I am a new creation in Christ. All things are passed away. All things have become new. I used to be angry, but that anger now has a stench. It stinks because it's dead. It's part of the old man. And I refuse to carry you around with me. You smell. Get away from me. Oh, come on now. That's a demonstration of your faith. Look at me and call me crazy if you will. But I'm an overcomer, baby. I'm an overcomer. Hallelujah. But thanks be unto God who giveth us the victory. Sure, Lord Jesus Christ. I have the victory because I refuse to sit down and play dead. Oh, I talk in the spirit world. Oh, get out of my house right now. You're not paying rent here. You better leave. And I'll go right to my CD and I will blare some Christian music that will reach into every room in the house. You've got to demonstrate your faith. It doesn't come by passivity or mental assent. Faith is action. Hebrews 11 one says, now, now, not yesterday or tomorrow, but now. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hallelujah. And, and that word evidence in some translations says it's the title deed. Okay? It's the title deed. Glory to God. Oh, hallelujah. So because of Jesus Christ, we do not have to live under the curse of anger. One of the meanings of the word iniquity, as I pointed out earlier, is the word fault. Is the word fault. And in James 5, 16, it says, confess your faults one to another, that you might be made whole. Amen? But when you look further at that word fault, it could mean a fracture in the crust of the earth. Anybody going with me? Yeah. We have read of various fault lines in our geography in, in many areas in the earth. For example, in California, there is the San Andreas fault line so that people who live in California, the possibility always exists of the earthquake because there is a fault line right under the surface that's a crack in, 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 in the earth. And as long as everything is fine, and everything is peaceful, and nothing goes wrong, there is no problem with that fault line. It's under there, but it's not going to create any. But listen to me. Hello? Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Something goes wrong. Something that triggers it. Amen. And everything starts to explode. Are you with me? Come on. Does this sound like anyone you know? Come on now. All is well. All is calm. All is peaceful as long as everything goes your way. As long as you don't have to make any concessions. As long as you don't have to make any positive compromise to accommodate another person's point of view. But if it doesn't go your way, the San Andreas fault, skyscrapers come tumbling down. Come on now. The freeway, the freeway is all discombobulated. And if you're on there, God helps you. 
must face it. I deal with it. God wants us to be whole. He wants us to be whole. He's paid the full price for every one of us to be whole. Totally whole. And this is progressive. It's step by step. Come on. You can't stop growing. You can't be reveling in yesterday's victories. That will not work today. We must continue to grow. We must continue to grow. Amen. Oh, glory to God. But there is good news. There is good news. Confess your faults one to another that you may be healed. And that word heal means to cure. It means to make whole. So Jesus came not only to forgive our sins, but he came to do much more. He came to make us completely Salvation is a complete package. Yes. Mm -hmm. Look at all the, excuse me, all the things Jesus went through. Last week we looked at the fact that in Isaiah 53, verse 6, he 